Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Pac Bell for giving us this opportunity to come and present our information and uh, have an information exchange. Uh, a little bit of information on uh, what the California Internet Federation is. Uh, research and educational networking has grown quite a bit in the past few years, and California is no exception. Uh, we have several regional networks, we have many institutional networks, and uh, in order to make these networks effective, they need to be interconnected. This interconnection requires coordination, and in that uh, regard, this last summer we had representatives uh, come from the various networks that are, we have in California. Uh, we met, figured out what, uh, uh, what kind of things we want to do, and uh, formed the California Internet Federation. Well, as I said, we got these uh, networks together, and we certainly welcome other networks uh, to join us as uh, they want to uh, coordinate with networking in California. Uh, the attitude towards the California Internet Federation was that we wanted it to be a group that got things done. So in that light, uh, we decided to make it more of an open forum rather than having a formal structure. It's a place where the various networks can meet. Uh, the California Internet Federation will serve as a catalyst for agreements between these networks, but not serve in um, the agreements themselves. Uh, this structure may change, but we thought it was most advantageous to have this structure in the meantime. Um, we have several working groups already that are working on major problems that uh, we have with interconnecting on these networks. And uh, current work is, seems to be going on quite well. So uh, we're pleased to be here to be able to present to you what uh, educational and research networking is like and uh, to see what we can do with, as far as future cooperation. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Bill Yunt now, who will uh, have a few comments and introduce uh, the, our section on national and uh, national research. Thanks, Russ. I'm going to be uh, extremely brief. I think that I'm uh, largely to blame for our being here this morning, but uh, I definitely will share the blame with Dan Shoup. Dan and I uh, <laughs> got together on this some time ago, and we've been working toward this day. I think that in addition to, as Russ pointed out, uh, connectivity among the networks in California, the major objective we have in the long term is a, the establishment of a firm infrastructure, a well-supported and long-lasting enterprise. And that is going to require a lot of cooperation from industry, government, and the educational sector. So it's in that spirit that uh, we're beginning, in a way, with this meeting with you folks. We're really very fortunate today to have with us uh, Doug Van Howling. Dr. Van Howling is the senior officer at the University of Michigan, responsible for a very large enterprise covering the information systems area as well as <coughs> communications and networking. And beyond that, within his organization uh, is a group that operates Merit, uh, in his purview at least. The Merit people operate the current national network backbone, the National Science Foundation network. And uh, uh, so Doug has an intimate knowledge. He also participates in many of the efforts underway across the country and, and in uh, uh, organizations such as EDUCOM and the Networking and Telecommunications Task Force who are attempting to escalate or raise the visibility of these matters nationwide and, uh, and to secure broader public support. So with that, I'll say no more and turn it over to Doug if we can rewire. Uh, this is a user-friendly uh, overhead projector. Uh, how many of you have gotten up to the front of a meeting and the person has spent the first three minutes of her presentation figuring out which switch it is that turns the overhead projector on? This one is very obvious. Uh, it's zero and one, big red button right on top, fantastic. I want to tell you all how delighted I am to be out here with you this morning. Um, as Bill mentioned, I have a real job and then I have an avocation. Uh, my real job is managing information technology for the University of Michigan and its uh, regional campuses. Uh, my avocation uh, of late uh, has been 
uh, trying to work with the uh, increasingly broad set of uh, people and institutions across the nation who have been working on building uh, what has been referred to as the National Research Network, what I call here the National Higher Education Research Network. Um, it's uh, all uh, an effort uh, to create a new infrastructure which we believe is critical to the future of this nation and its regions. What I want to do this morning is take as few moments as possible to talk about uh, the origins of that, uh, of that network, essentially to provide for all of us a level set. So we all have uh, in common at least my conception of what this is all about. Now, we're very lucky. Bill Bostwick is going to follow me. And uh, Bill uh, uh, has the same kind of vocational, avocational kind of uh, thing going on in his life that I do. Um, and he looks at this uh, from a somewhat different point of view. So I would think that between Bill's comments and mine, you will wind up with a very, a very uh, complete picture of the uh, current activities that are going on uh, looking at it from two slightly different perspectives at the national level. What I want to do is talk about uh, where this technology originated, and that uh, is uh, with the ARPANET. Talk a little bit about some interim uh, and uh, still very important networks, and then focus most of my attention on the large current internet backbone. In a, and um, for those of you who don't know what that means at uh, this point, you will by the time I get to that. And then finally, I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about some things that we have learned and where we might head in the future. Something that's very important to me is that you feel free to ask questions. Because this is an effort to do a level set. It's very important that if I somehow get out there into some territory that you, you can't quite map, that you stop me and we stop and map it before I try to go on. So please don't hesitate to yell if you uh, can't just get my attention by uh, making some other gesture. Sometimes I get going and I'm hard to stop. Let's start and talk about the, uh, in some sense, uh, the uh, granddaddy of this, of this technology. Um, the ARPANET, uh, which is a network that was established by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, was established in 1969. And it pioneered the fundamental technology that has turned out to be so important to this network. That, that technology is packet switching, where we essentially take a circuit uh, that in the past has usually been a lease circuit and carry a large number of concurrent streams on it through packet switching. Um, the uh, DARPA developed a set of protocols uh, called the TCP IP uh, protocol suite, um, which became a standard for the Department of Defense in 1982. That protocol is the foundation for what we today call the internet. Now, you'll see internet used in a lot of different ways. Um, when we talk about internet, what we mean is a network that while it may be organizationally not integrated, while it may in fact uh, be not integrated in terms of funding or management uh, to a large extent, it does carry in common this set of protocols called the DARPA protocols or TCP IP as, as they've been called. Now actually the protocols are broader than just TCP IP, but it's that integration around those DARPA protocols that has created the national internet. Because once DOD standardized on that set of protocols, um, then those folks who are active in higher education and industrial research having to do with information science all moved in the direction of using those protocols. And, and, and it very uh, soon became the fact that um, if you were a serious researcher or scholar in the area of information science, artificial intelligence, um, uh, computer engineering, that you needed to have access to this uh, uh, DARPA network called uh, ARPANET. And your uh, organization had to support this set of protocols because an enormous amount of the intellectual activity that went on in those fields took place over that network. Um, now, 
as a result, this has become the de facto standard for higher education and research. That presents us with an interesting problem, because the world is, in fact, moving toward in an OSI direction, and we're busy understanding how we can merge with that world stream without losing things along the way. And, uh, but nonetheless, right now, if you go on most of the major research campuses, most of the major research organizations in the United States, you'll find that they, have, they are using this set of protocols uh, to support their uh, networking. Now, the ARPANET was not officially a public network. It was restricted to people who had uh, contracts with appropriate federal contracting agencies. Um, the fact of the matter is that the ARPANET controls over the routing of packets was never uh, enforced so tightly as to make that restriction uh, particularly onerous. And the result is that although uh, we had that official understanding, and we were very careful in terms of, especially in the early years, about how we interconnected our networks with the uh, ARPANET backbone across the nation. Um, we did, over a period of time, uh, have an enormous number of uh, graduate students working in related areas, as well as faculty, uh, and of course, industrial researchers using this network. Uh, some, I have to say, uh, with only somewhat tenuous uh, relationships to the Department of Defense itself. Um, the uh, ARPANET was operated by the Defense Communications Agency with network operations support from Bolt, Baranek, and Newman and the Network Information Center at SRI. Um, it's now being dismantled. Uh, the ARPANET is being taken apart as we, as we meet, um, and that is creating an interesting challenge for a lot of us as we evolve uh, towards uh, the replacement structure because it is literally the fact that uh, higher education and research in this country uh, would be in enormous trouble without an ARPANET-like structure. And I'll talk about that replacement. Um, DOD, for its part, is uh, developing a res defense research internet for their use. And uh, my expectations, you'll hear more about this as well as we go on uh, during the morning. So ARPANET was the foundation network pioneered in the technology proved the feasibility of the kind of thing that, about which we are talking today. Before I go on and talk about some of the other network initiatives, are there any questions about uh, the ARPANET and its uh, foundations and directions? Yes. It turns out that um, that's a problem that is a major issue for DOD as well, as you can imagine, because of course, of course, there's a very heavy investment in the Defense Department in that area. There's a, there's a lot of research, and now it's well beyond the research state, that has shown that we can in fact put the OSI stack uh, on top of the IP transport layer um, uh, by using some thin interfaces. There's a, there's a number of efforts being undertaken there. The real problem uh, that we're confronting is, is the European and uh, strong insistence and the mixed kind of understanding and feelings in the United States about circuit-oriented kinds of packet circuits versus uh, the kind of uh, packet uh, routing uh, uh, arrangements that are now in use in the ARPANET. And uh, trying to find out how to pull those two things together is, in fact, uh, uh, giving us a good deal more trouble than just understanding how to move the bits around. So it's really the organizational issue. Now, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but uh, that's, that's, the, that's the set of things we're into right now. Let me uh, uh, just give you a few maps here to give you some notion. Um, this is really sort of uh, the ARPANET at its peak uh, to give you a sense of the topology of that network. Um, and as you can see, uh, uh, dismantling a network of this size, uh, and you'll see in a moment this is only part of what we're talking about, is, uh, is a major undertaking. Um, 
Uh, but this gives you some idea of the amount of uh, the, the, the complexity in the circuits uh, that are involved in ARPANET as of um, uh, June of last year. Now, the thing that uh, is so important to understand about the internet is, is that, um, is that uh, uh, the internet um, has, uh, for a lot of years, used the ARPANET as a central facility, but that, in fact, there are a very large number of other networks, and this one does not capture them all by any means, um, that also use that same set of protocols. The, the network about which I'll spend most of my time today, the NSF, net, NSF backbone, is that little square up there uh, that uses the same protocols. You see a state network called NISERNet up there in the upper corner. Um, I rather imagine uh, that if this was updated at the appropriate time that the various California internets are on this map, but I can't find them given the resolution of what I can read on that screen. Um, but uh, the thing that you understand very rapidly when you look at this is that the ARPANET came to be a backbone IP communications facility for the United States that supported a large number of other IP-based networks that developed around the country. One of the very important aspects of the, of the uh, IP network uh, is that it provided a very broad range in response to instantaneous demand for bandwidth. That is, the network performed quite nicely at 100 baud, which was uh, the average data rate that came out of somebody plinking away at a terminal. Um, it also performed quite nicely at, at several hundred kilobaud um, uh, if you had the right kind of links in place when you wanted to move a file in a hurry. And the individual who was working uh, as an end user out on one end of that network didn't have to do anything to make that bandwidth transition. That was a demand-based transition depending on what the workstation or the terminal uh, demanded at the time of the need. And that has turned out to be very important in terms of the kinds of applications uh, that the network supports. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but first of all, I'm going to talk briefly about two other network infrastructures that got developed in the United States uh, in the interim period. The first is the computer science network, CSNet. It was established in 81 with initial grant funding from the National Science Foundation. I mentioned earlier that to be part of the fraternity in computer science, you simply had to have a connection to the internet. We had a lot of institutions around the country that did not have such connections um, uh, because there wasn't a good argument that could be made at those research facilities for a connection to a DOD-sponsored network. CSNet was an attempt, fundamentally, to fix that problem by creating other methods of connecting to the internet. Um, and uh, they used uh, packet switching protocols that were compatible with the ARPANET, that is the IP network. Um, it put uh, the hosts that are on uh, ARPANET were by agreement made available to CSNet. Um, and this one was open not just to DOD, but to all advanced uh, research and development organizations, including industry. There was a large industrial, and still is, a large industrial involvement in CSNet. It began to sponsor international links, and it used both leased and switched circuits for the circuit infrastructure underneath the packet uh, environment. But again, remember that this is essentially a, still a packet kind of an environment. Um, it was operated and is operated by the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research uh, out, of, uh, out of Boulder, and it had also a coordination information center at BBNN. About 180 host computers that organization is now involved with merger discussions with the next network I want to talk to you about. Um, one of the things that it's important to understand about this is this turned out to be a relatively low-cost gateway into the IP networking world because if you use dial-up circuits, you could several times a day have your computer dial into this network and move a bunch of information. And so it provided a very ready access for the, a, a lower tier of usage than uh, was uh, provided to the essential ARPANET. Any questions about CSNet? Yes. 
CSNet and BitNet have voted to merge. The, um, the uh, uh, transition committees are busy putting the plan together to actually do that. Uh, my expectation is that over the next year and a half, you will see them effectively merged into a, into a signal organization. Yes? Um, it really would depend very much on how the particular CSNet uh, end user organization was connected. If the connection was one of these uh, episodic dial up connections, then typically the CSNet um, effort was limited to mail transport. And it was relatively, although one could certainly queue up a file as mail and move it, um, that was not a typical use. Um, if, though, uh, they, the middle level was used, which was using the X25 packet net to move information on CSNet, and that, of course, was not a, a, a dial-up kind of thing, then all of the same applications that were undertaken in the ARPANET could be undertaken in CSNet. Um, and then, of course, the lease circuits were, were very, much, uh, very much like ARPANET. Now, um, at the beginning, it was the case that the bandwidth that you typically had on a CSNet node was lower than you would have at an ARPANET node, and that put an inherent limitation on. As the network's load grew, grew uh, that turned out de facto not to be the case. Um, and so uh, for a lot of institutions, uh, CSNet connection uh, was really a, a very functional uh, kind of a, a solution. I should say that I should stress here that CSNet was built on a very strong collaboration between industry and higher education. There was a lot of industrial involvement and investment in CSNet, and still is. Another network, and this, this is an interesting one, because this, this network, unlike the two that I've talked about, was not built on top of the IP protocols, but was in fact built on top of IBM's, um, uh, not really SNA, but RSCS uh, uh, protocols um, was developed, and this was another networking effort that was, a, that was built uh, to preserve very low entry costs. And in fact, in some sense, uh, to use some of the same language that's been used, this was the network for the rest of us. There was a sense in which the DARPA network, the internet, CSNet, was the network that was developed and used most heavily by the computer science artificial intelligence community. Um, it was not uh, typically used very heavily by a historian or an English professor, uh, 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 etc., an undergraduate student. What happened um, was that there was a feeling that we needed to provide a lower cost uh, network infrastructure that tied into the large institutional computing environments we had at many of our universities. Um, it, was support, it was started really on a model IBM had discovered internally that they could tie together large mainframes essentially by passing the equivalent of card decks back and forth across lease lines between the main, mainframes and then uh, uh, encode in those card decks uh, essentially all the structure they needed to recreate files at both ends of the activity. Um, and um, it was that same software was employed in 81 uh, between the City University of New York and Yale uh, to create the first link outside of IBM between institutions moving information uh, back and forth using those same protocols. The whole foundation behind uh, the BitNet uh, organization was at its founding that all you have to do is provide a circuit to the nearest node and nearest, in this case, means cost of telecommunications line, um, and guarantee to offer an attachment point for somebody who wants to send a circuit to you. Um, there was no formal bureaucracy. The thing just grew uh, like mushrooms grow uh, in a damp climate. Um, and uh, we had them springing up all over the nation. Um, BitNet uh, now, I think, connects several hundred institutions uh, across the country, uh, essentially still using those same protocols. It got big enough that uh, uh, it went through a painful transition from an entirely voluntary organization to a, a not-for-profit corporation. 
um, and uh, is now uh, BitNet Inc. And um, uh, the uh, Network Information Center is at Educom in uh, Princeton. Uh, the uh, development and operations work has been done at the City University of New York. It's open to the full higher education research community. It has had restrictions on access by commercial research organizations, although those uh, usage restrictions are now being revised, and it's opening up more broadly. And IBM has supplied, supplied some support here for the central staffing of this activity. It's self-supporting um, via the membership fees, and it is now developing technology that will allow it to essentially encapsulate its data flow into the uh, uh, DARPA protocol streams so it will be able to take advantage of the national infrastructure for moving data over long distance. Um, we've got more than 400 establishments connected uh, to this network now. It's, uh, it's become um, a very important part of the infrastructure for communications in higher education. It'd be hard to overstate um, how uh, important this relatively primitive technological artifact has become uh, to higher education uh, in the United States. And of course, now as we have this convergent course between CSNet and BitNet underway, you're going to see a merging of these two networks and a combination of the services they both provide. And that will help us consolidate uh, this. And you also see here a movement towards making sure that both of these networks uh, fully uh, interoperate with the internet uh, that's, that's now in place across the nation. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, the uh, the 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 uh, empirical answer to that question is that it, of course, depends on the load that's on the network. Um, and um, uh, but the, the raw circuit speeds. Uh, typically, BitNet links uh, have been 9,600 baud links, and since it's a store and forward network, quite often a uh, uh, information will go through several hops getting to you, stopping at a mainframe each time, getting queued up as a file, and then being re-emitted. So it quite often would take uh, a couple of hours uh, for a file to move across the country to you. Um, and partly for that reason, remote login to a remote computer really wasn't feasible. Uh, in most cases using the BitNet technology. The ARPANET links were 56 kilobit links. Um, they went higher in some cases. Uh, and uh, because uh, the intervening machines were not uh, essentially store and forward machines, but packet switches, uh, you could actually do uh, interactive remote log on through the ARPANET. Um, when ARPANET was performing well, um, you could move files very rapidly across the country. Uh, towards the end of ARPANET's life, uh, the load got so heavy that uh, people often use BitNet to move information across the country rather than ARPANET. Um, uh, but uh, it really depended more on which culture you were in, uh, which network you used, rather than the performance characteristics. Any other questions? Comments? Well, now let's talk about uh, where we are today in some sense. Um, in uh, in 1986, as most of you are aware, uh, the federal government established uh, six national supercomputing centers across the country um, through the National Science Foundation. It was fairly rapidly apparent that if those were going to be true national facilities, there was a need to provide some type of network infrastructure. And each one of those centers had its own uh, sort of regional network that was developed as part of establishing those centers. Um, the NSF therefore uh, worked with those centers uh, to develop a backbone which was actually managed at the beginning by the centers themselves, using the IP protocols to connect uh, those various centers together. And um, it turns out that because the protocols were the same, once again it was possible to use uh, the network that was developed in support of the supercomputing centers as a way to reach uh, into the host and CSNet and ARPANET. Um, this network was open to higher education and research programs nationwide, 
Um, and it rapidly became not simply a structure to access the supercomputing centers, but a general transport uh, in the uh, world of internets, uh, that little NSF net box I showed up there, um, as a way of moving information around. It started through the use of uh, lease lines, and there was a cooperative agreement with ARPANET to actually provide a fair hunk of the uh, nodal capacity and expanded network that was needed during the startup period of NSFNet. It has now evolved into a hierarchical network, and I think the structure of this network has particular interest for uh, you folks in California, because there's a sense in which the way California is evolving, uh, even within the state, uh, you're, you're likely to see some hierarchy. Um, the lowest level of the hierarchy, of course, is the campus, whether it's the uh, university campus or a, a research campus uh, in a, in a for-profit or a not-for-profit environment. Um, and within those campuses, typically what you're seeing today are uh, Ethernet uh, types of implementations um, uh, running the IP protocols, um, although there are enormous numbers of physical transports that are actually used at the lowest level. Um, you're seeing a lot of movement now uh, in the larger, uh, more intense campuses to moving to the uh, precursors to the FDDI uh, uh, fiber standards. So you're seeing uh, somewhere between 10 and 100 megabit kinds of data rates uh, in the campus environment, typically, uh, around the country. The next level up has been a regional network structure uh, that has been put together usually with cooperative funding from the federal government and, and the various institutions and other organizations in the state. In many cases, those cooperative efforts have included uh, substantial industrial participation, uh, both from telecommunications carriers and from other industries within the state. And of course, what that has done is it's helped build, not only uh, help support the infrastructure, but it has also uh, built closer ties between those industrial research organizations and the higher education community, which I believe is uh, very desirable. Um, there are a number of those regional networks now around the country, um, and there are more being created as we speak. Um, I think I can say with that with some confidence, although I can't name one this instant, uh, because the the last one I knew about, the CIC net that was in the Midwest, is now operational. So uh, there's another one I'm sure that I'm not aware of. There we go. Thank you. Um, at any rate, the, the fact is that the next level up then has been to provide a backbone that connects these regional networks together. And the NSF net backbone is, in fact, uh, the thing that I want to spend a little time on. But you can see that because of the protocol uh, compatibilities we have, we can, in fact, separately manage all three levels of this hierarchy as long as we have some structure to agree on routing um, and uh, access and other kinds of policy issues uh, that are required to uh, uh, keep the whole network running in a viable fashion. Um, the uh, NSFNet is now the, provides a national backbone uh, for this activity. It's operated by Merit, which is a Michigan regional network, a regional network that provides networking in the state of Michigan. Um, that uh, is, in fact, a consortium of Michigan universities. There are eight universities in Michigan that, in fact, are the owners of Merit. It's a not-for-profit corporation. Um, the NSFNet backbone, part of Merit's operation, is, in fact, jointly sponsored by IBM, who has provided software and uh, packet switching technology, MCI providing the long lines uh, uh, data trans uh, uh, port, uh, essentially the circuits, uh, the state of Michigan, who's made an investment of a million dollars a year over the five-year life of the contract, and of course the National Science Foundation, which has invested about $14 million uh, in, in its commitment uh, to create this network. Yes. Uh, roughly, uh, it's, it's mainly in kind, but the value of the MCI um, contribution in terms of bandwidth is somewhere over the, over the period of the uh, five-year period, 
somewhere in the neighborhood of $7 million. The uh, value of IBM's contribution in software and hardware is a little bit more difficult to calculate, but it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million. Um, so in fact, it's important to remember when you think about the NSF net backbone itself is that most of the funding does not come from the federal government. Uh, because when you add it all up, you add the state of Michigan's contribution, in fact, um, there are about $2 from outside NSF for each dollar the NSF has put in. It's roughly a $45 million effort over a five-year period. It's uh, especially important also to remember that that backbone is only a very small amount of the total network. So that uh, $45 million investment, in fact, leverages an immensely larger investment at the regional and the campus level down underneath it. Yes? Um, MCI is providing uh, bandwidth at no charge except for its out-of-pocket expenses for the circuits that it needs to implement the tails. And I'm sure that you're providing some of those. Um, and uh, um, IBM is providing hardware um, and people. Um, and they are paying for uh, the development of software. They have not provided a direct uh, direct funding uh, to merit uh, in dollars. There are IBM staff cited at merit headquarters in Ann Arbor uh, working, you know, uh, cheek by jowl with our people to build this network. There, the structure is called, in IBM jargon, a joint study. Um, and, uh, and, and merit has executed joint study agreements with IBM and with MCI uh, to uh, uh, serve as the foundation for this activity. There are now, um, it's, it's important to say something about the structure of this network. Um, this network, the uh, NSF net backbone, in fact, uses a combination of circuit and packet switching technology. Um, the, uh, we call it the circuit cloud that provides the uh, bandwidth to connect the packet switches together is precisely that. We don't think of it as a set of circuits tying those packet switches together. We think of it as a set of uh, bandwidth that we can flexibly allocate um, to the paths between the various packet switches. That's very important to us because what it means is that we can dynamically adapt the circuit uh, topography of the network to the particular load that's being placed on the network from time to time. And uh, avoid, for instance, having to pass a packet through a large number of packet switches if, in fact, we've got a very large no load that is going uh, between two packet switches that would otherwise could only be reached uh, by transversing uh, intermediary switches. We can essentially switch a circuit in directly between uh, any two switches. We started this out with all T1 circuits, uh, and the circuits were, in fact, split into third T1 uh, bandwidth because that was the capacity of our packet switches at the beginning. We are now in the process of upgrading uh, to full T1. Um, so each of our packet switches will have a minimum of uh, three T1 circuits uh, coming in. Um, there's a very substantial amount of bandwidth in this network uh, um, with T1 on each of the individual routes. Uh, plus our ability to actually move that bandwidth around uh, in terms of how it's arrayed between the various circuits. In uh, next year, we will move this network, uh, um, assuming we're able to uh, negotiate all of the organizational and political uh, issues, uh, up to T3 bandwidths. Uh, the technology is already clearly in hand for doing that. Uh, we've got a, a, a plan in place uh, to move that. So in fact, we'll probably be running um, probably at the beginning at some fractional part uh, for each packet switch of, of the 45 megabit T3 uh, speeds. But in fact, the, the circuit cloud will essentially go up conceptually to a T3 uh, kind of a cloud. We expect we're going to need that um, because of the growth that we're seeing uh, in demand uh, on this network. MCI and IBM are obviously working closely with us to make the necessary technology upgrades that are required uh, to uh, make this all possible. 
We're also, uh, we also have a separate network that is really not part of this network that the sponsors have, have constructed call, that is really a research and development network. And in that network, we're busy uh, bringing the ISO protocol suite in so that in fact we'll be ready uh, to start providing that. And we're already experimenting with uh, some ISO packet switches in the same rack with the other packet switches so that we can in fact start to move the other protocols uh, over this network. We're using, we're using MCI's uh, uh, digital reconfiguration uh, product. It's essentially a product that they are uh, uh, selling. We have, uh, we're now in the process of installing in our uh, Merit Network Control Center in Ann Arbor a direct interface to their, uh, to their uh, center that configures uh, this backbone. So we'll, in fact, be able to allocate that uh, flexibly from our own control center. As we go to the full T1, the, the IDNXs are coming out. Uh, as we go back to T3, we'll probably wind up putting some type of multiplexer back in um, as, as we uh, move across these boundaries of capacity between the packet switches and the circuits. So you're controlling then or, or sending signals to those DACs to cause the dynamic routing? That's right. We're, we're, sending that, we're sending our signals to uh, to MCI, and then MCI actually manages this, those, those circuits. Any other questions? Let me just show you a few uh, slide or two to give you some sense. Here's the uh, NSFnet topology that was established at the beginning. Um, this NSFnet topology is now being modified substantially. For instance, one of the one of the problems we've got is tail circuits like this one that aren't multiply connected. Um, and uh, in fact, if you look at the current physical topology, there's a lot more multiple connection than that shows. As we go through this upgrade to T1, we're substantially improving that. Um, interestingly enough, not because we've had a lot of problem with service interruption, uh, but because we just want to be safe rather than sorry. Um, here are the uh, connected uh, NSF supported, National Science Foundation supported IP networks across the country. There's no reason for you to try to read this, but it gives you some idea. Uh, I believe that the only two states that do not now have an NSF supported uh, network activity are those two states. Well, and up here. Just show you uh, the reason we think that that T3 is going to be in order. You can see that this uh, that this this curve is headed in a in a clear direction. What 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 we believe we don't know for sure because uh, it, the NSF the whole NSF net structure is essentially driven by literally. Uh, tens of thousands of researchers and scientists across the nation. And, and while we can poll them, we don't know for sure why they're doing what they're doing. But what we do know is that the precursor network infrastructure was saturated. And so a lot of people were sitting there trying to do things that they couldn't do. So of course we had an initial surge of those people just being unleashed to do the things that they wanted to do. Um, as people began to discover that it was possible to do things, that the pioneers had tried but had gotten into trouble on, then they had a lot of early followers. Um, what we're seeing is um, less and less remote logon kind of traffic and more and more file transfer, electronic mail uh, kind of things. And where we're clearly headed is towards remote operation of major facilities, whether they be supercomputers or space telescopes uh, uh, and things like that and the interconnection of large file systems. Um, we are building an institutional file system at Michigan, for instance. There's another one very similar to it that's been built at Carnegie Mellon. And for a period, we essentially didn't even establish a local cell. We just used Carnegie Mellons across the network. Um, there's a set of applications um, that frankly weren't even possible in, uh, with the earlier technology. I'm concerned here that I am uh, way over time. So I'm going to try to get very rapidly through this last slide. 
um, I, I uh, very much want you to hear uh, Barry's perspective on this as well. I've already alluded to the fact that one thing we have learned is that an individual user will one moment essentially be operating as a uh, simulating a dumb terminal with some host somewhere, and the very next moment will uh, do a mouse click on the workstation, which will move that user into an environment that immediately demands a graphic frame from a supercomputer. And then a few moments later, that user will uh, go out and call for a file that is stored somewhere else on the network. And the kind of bandwidth characteristics that an individual user places on this network um, ranges across a factor uh, not just one or two orders of magnitude, but four or five orders of magnitude uh, from one moment to the next. Um, now, since the pipe into the back of the user's workstation is quite often an Ethernet pipe, so you've got 10 megabits sort of tying you off at the top, um, uh, what, you, what you see uh, going on here is a very bursty kind of a, a network load going into each user. Um, that's one of the reasons that the packet switching technology has proved to be so important. Because on that kind of frequency, actually changing the throughput of a circuit connection would be a very difficult thing to engineer. Um, the, uh, so what we've done is we've sort of treated the circuit infrastructure very much like people used to treat big time sharing computers. Um, you put enough capacity in place and you share it broadly enough so that you can handle a wide range of variation by individual users in the environment. Um, second thing is we found out that we really need very broad addressability so that a user can simultaneously connect to six or seven different resources to support a single piece of intellectual work. A user, as I said earlier, may be using several host computers, uh, be connected to a file system, and be working with some type of remote scientific interest in instrument all at the same time during their use of the network. So they need multiple virtual connections, essentially established as they operate um, out into the network. Um, finally, we've discovered that the industrial ties and the non-United States uh, research uh, and scholarly community have been very important. I mentioned earlier that we've got very rapid growth underway. I won't say much about this. The uh, packet switching technology means that once we bring it in, uh, the internet packet switch protocols into our campus uh, network, the cost for an individual user attaching to this network is relatively low, so the barriers to entry are pretty low. We've had some enormous benefits already to scholarship and research, and um, I think I'm preaching to the converted here, so I won't say much about that, except to say that one of the very exciting things we've seen is a lot of collaboration among researchers. On my campus, just a quick anecdote, um, I had been championing a high bandwidth on-campus network in Ann Arbor for some time, and it had real difficulty selling it um, to the physical science researchers. When the NSF net thing happened, it wasn't more than about three hours after the announcement that I had physicists, chemists, and so on in my, uh, literally in my office, uh, pounding on my desk, asking me why I hadn't put a more powerful network in on campus so that they would be able to communicate with their colleagues at other places across the world. And I, sh I sheepishly said, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, uh, and we'll go do it just as fast as we can. And we did. Um, uh, but at any rate, uh, the, the notion of being able to reach out of your own local community to do collaboration turns out to be very important to research. And I believe will help us very much in moving our science more rapidly to application, which I think is critical to this nation's future. Um, we've got a world-class system in higher education and research. It's broadly distributed and very decentralized in the United States. A network capability like this that allows people to flexibly pull together working groups is ideally suited to the way our infrastructure for science, research, development has, has evolved in the United States. And my belief is that if we don't have this kind of network, we won't be able to take advantage of our prowess in these areas as a nation. Because we are not going to be able to do it. Uh, we're not going to be able to overlay some hierarchical network structure on what is essentially a very broadly distributed way this nation has organized its activities in this sector. So it turns out, I believe, that there's a, um, 
a lot to be gained by looking back and seeing how this has evolved and seeing how it uh, can meet our needs in the future. We have a conference coming up in early April, April called Net 89, which is the second of these conferences. The first one was last year about this time, um, where we're drawing together people from all over the country uh, to look at this agenda. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we had a uh, meeting in uh, just outside of Washington that drew people together, and in fact, we had some people from around this table at that meeting uh, to try to look at where we needed to head in terms of a national policy space. And we're working on some policy documents there. There won't be universal agreement on these documents, and we're not expecting that, but we are expecting they'll provide a concrete basis for people to argue uh, and debate as we move forward to, to build this network. And we very much invite your participation, continued participation, I think is the right way to say it, in that effort. Obviously, we would have chose a different name if we were a public committee and not a, a government agency committee. But the prick is made up of uh, currently these organizations, DARPA, NSF, um, the Department of Energy, NASA, and the uh, Department of <coughs> Health and Human Services. Uh, we also have, well, let me talk about this first. By the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime you'd like. Um, these were the original members. We started in uh, the fall of 1987. Most of these people had been working together. I was on an assignment to the Department of Energy at the time to help with the development of ESnet. And uh, somehow I wound up being the chairman of this organization. Uh, I lost that job last week in Washington. I'm now called the executive director because I'm not a federal employee. And as, as being back in, in uh, Los Alamos, I no longer meet the, the membership criteria you see on the slide. And that is, you must be a federal employee or so designated by an agency to represent that agency. So that's changed a little bit. Uh, there are a couple other changes. Uh, John Cavallini has left the Department of Health and Human Services, and he's been replaced by Peter Altman. And, uh, my uh, view graph next week when I get back to Washington to my secretary there will show that change for the, for the next presentation I have to do on this. Uh, I talked a little bit about the criteria for membership. Um, besides being a federal employee or representing a federal agency, you must be responsible for the evolution of a computer network that supports scientific research or scholarly activities. And you must be authorized for the agency that you represent to be able to commit resources. We all know what resources are. That mostly means funds. Um, we have two other members of the of the PRIC who are what we call um, observer members, a uh, representative from NOAA and a representative from USGS, US Geological Survey. Um, we developed this type of membership because there were some people who didn't want to meet the bottom criteria. I think in the end, uh, when they have the resources to commit, they'll come in as, as full members. But right now, they're participating in our meetings, very actively involved with, with what we're doing and, and following the plans. Um, we also have two observer members, one from Defense Communications Agency and one from U uh, GSA. General Services Administration. And again, this is to coordinate technologies. They run a lot of the voice circuits, the federal telephone system, uh, some of the defense network applications and, and things like that. It seems at least for the last few years, and especially since the National Science Foundation Network started, started up, that the government agencies were kind of in this friendly competition of uh, trying to see who could have the biggest and the best research network in the country. Uh, DOE was trying to combine some of their activities and bring them up to T1 speeds. Uh, because NSF was going to T1, everybody had to go to T1. The ARPANET was going down, but a new network was, was talked about in its place called the Defense Research Internet, which you've heard just a little bit about. And what we started talking about was the best way to have the biggest and the best was to combine them all into one. 
and so those were our initial goals. Um, so the purpose of the PRIC was to start sharing resources, and we've had uh, several demonstrations of that. NASA and NSF are sharing a line to France, this time DOE, and NASA are planning to share one to Germany, if they can work out all the details. Um, we constantly see people making arrangements whereby, oh gee, I need a 56 or a, or a T1 type link from point A to point B, and somebody's already got one, why can't I use theirs? So, so that, that is, is, is happening, and it's happening very rapidly. Um, the PRIC also, as its purpose, promotes the evolution of an open federal research network, and I'm going to talk more, a little bit more about that. It's now called the National Research Network. Uh, we are, are very actively involved in coordinating the development of internet management techniques. We, we have an engineering group that meets uh, that advises the, uh, the PRIC. Uh, we call it our, our technical support. Um, we are very much involved in the coordination now of network research and development, uh, and that we'll get probably a little more into in the program plan. Uh, to be a source of coordinated multi-agency administrative oversight to the Internet Activities Board, and I thought there was going to be some kind of presentation on the IEB, but I, I hope most of you know about it. John is, is one of the task force members. Uh, we look at the IEB as the, the people since 1969, when the ARPANET started, who have kept that up and running and, and uh, did a tremendous job. It's a technical body who works on, on different problems. Uh, some of the last few years, a lot of those have been congestion, things like that, routing algorithms, whatever. Um, and coordinate international connections of the agency networks represented by the PRIC. Uh, we will be meeting next month in England with another organization called the CCIRN, which is Coordinating Committee for Intercontinental Research Networks. Um, and it started out as a pretty much a, a North American, well, a, I would say a U.S. European kind of group. It's now expanded to Canada some other countries. Uh, we, we hope it grows worldwide, but, but primarily it was started to coordinate the evolution of, uh, well, let me put it another way. The United States has about 25 to 30 satellite links to Europe that exist today. What we would like to see for the long term is a fiber connection to a network in Europe that's run very much like our National Research Network. We see that as a possibility now with the deregulation of the PTTs in Europe uh, that I think gets finished up in about 1992 and concessions are already being made there. And we're very actively involved working with the Europeans. Um, and they, they have plans to develop, I think, initially a two megabit backbone. And it would be much more cost effective for us to share a high bandwidth fiber link to Europe than it would be to pay what we pay for 25 or 30 satellite connections. Any questions? I went a little fast, I think. Uh, nothing so far. Usually people want to pick on the feds for something, since I'm here to talk for them. <laughs> yeah, I know, but probably be back. Uh, I mentioned. Uh, a plan, as far as I know, outside of, of the IEB that I mentioned earlier and the federal agencies, uh, no one has talked outside. This is still very much in draft. It's on the 6 o'clock news tonight. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes me nervous about this camera. But it's linked in, so you don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think most of you are aware of the activities of the Fix-It Committee. The Fix-It Committee is the Federal Coordinating Council, or committee I call it, Council on Science, Engineering, and Technology. Um, early in the Reagan administration, I was a federal employee at the time. Um, I started to work with some people in the Department of Energy on the early Fix-It initiative, which was, was primarily driven by keeping the United States um, ahead of 
the Japanese, the Germans, anyone outside of the United States who were pri primarily in development of supercomputers. And it was, it was, you know, how are we going to keep at the leading edge um, in the supercomputer industry? Um, out of Fixit were born two other subcommittees, one concerned with software development and one concerned with net networking. Um, and these initiatives have recently been introduced in a bill by Senator Al Albert Gore. Um, it's an authorization bill through the Senate to um, authorize Authorization bills always bother me a little bit because you can authorize all the money you want, but until it's appropriated, it, it doesn't do you a lot of good. But certainly having, having in our initiative for networking, there's $400 million. Um, having an authorized allows the agencies that are represented by the PRIC to then ask for, for certain R&D funds to support that, that effort. And since all of the agencies have been involved in this effort, um, we, we feel it's a good start to get us going. Um, after after the, the FIXIC subcommittee for networking put together their initiatives, they also had a review at the NRC by, by a group called the National Review Committee, of which you had one member here on that. Um, this group recommended several things that we're trying to address in this program plan, and we hope that, that we've, we've addressed all of their concerns. Um, I haven't done this one before. I just got these off, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it. If you have some questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, the objectives, as, as defined by Fixit, for a national research network uh, correspond to what I have here. It's stage, in stage one um, of this program, we would upgrade the trunks of existing backbone nets, networks of the participating agency, the FRIC, to 1.5 megabit. Um, the agency networks would remain distinct and individually funded, but not would but would be interconnected to permit interagency communication. We, all of the agencies of, of the FRIC have have signed memorandums of understanding that allow them to do what you what you see in the first part there. And in fact, we have installed gateways between every agency of the PRIC um, and what we call the Internet. So the networks operated by DOE are gated to the National Science Foundation, to the, the ARPANET, the, uh, to NASA's networks. We're all, we're all doing that. So we've pretty much put that in, in place. One of the recommendations of the uh, National Review Council was that we provide in users with gigabits with megabit speeds as soon as possible and we're attempting to do that in the early stages um, in stage two um, you heard that, it, that the National Science Foundation will go to a 45 megabit backbone in about a year year to a year and a half um, we plan in stage two better read this before I say um, what we plan to do is to bring up in stage two a 45 megabit backbone that would still be um, probably muxed and shared initially uh, by the agencies because we don't have all of the, the development we need. Maybe I can explain it a little better with this um, as to where we're going. I'm not sure this one is that focused or <coughs> that's a little better. Um, each of the networks would then I'm sorry, I have the wrong one. Well, no, I don't. Um, what what you see at the top that's called the NSF net and the research internet backbone, which we've called the rib, are both forty five megabit backbones. And we start out with each of these uh, agencies, the ARPANET, the ESNET, uh, the NASA ScienceNet, and whatever et other networks we have. Um, we first develop what we call a, a national networking test bed, uh, which DARPA 
has already put out or awarded a contract on, I believe, at this time. That will initially start at, if I remember right, about 10 megabits. And then we go on to the 45 megabit, which NSF has put out on the street for us as of last month. I believe they had the, the, uh, the conference there last month. And what we hope to do is develop the, the kind of gateways and protocols that we need to allow all of the agencies to share the same bandwidth. You can imagine our problem right now. Every government agency provides to universities grants who then go out and buy data links, whether they, they're 9.6 or 56, to go from point A to point B. Um, and it's very hard when you're sharing these, these different, when you have a, a NASA grantee talking to a DOE uh, across the country that may be, u may be using the NSF links to get there to tell who, who you charge for this kind of traffic or to, to keep track of it. It's a very difficult thing to do. So a lot of our research and development will be in, in routing um, and doing these gateways so that we can keep track. We can, we can put a gateway between one network and another. We can tell that there's so much traffic coming in and so much traffic going out. But, but really knowing what's going on is, is a little more difficult. So that's where we merge at the end then with the 45. And by the way, this is a gigabit type of network. Um, and when we get to the end in stage three, um, as you can see, it's the research and development implication or implementation activity that will accumulate in a shared network with multi gigabit per second trunks. Um, we've talked to some of the people that that say they already have gigabit applications, and we're like any other science, we're we're convinced that before we get to the gigabit applications, we're going to find people telling us they need terabits, and so it'll go on and on. Um, By the way, I, I probably didn't say the most important thing about, about what we're trying to do with this National Research Network. I think the most significant thing that, that you could say about the program plan in itself is that its goal is to get the federal government out of the business of owning and operating research networks. It calls for a five-year plan that would hopefully turn all of government networks over to someone in industry to run. Um, you've heard a lot about the regionals. Uh, <coughs> we know pretty much how they're going to be operated and supported. Um, we intend in this, in this plan to continue to help support the regionals until we get to this backbone, this national research network. We would hope someone would take that over at that point when it reaches the gigabit speeds. When the research and development is completed that allows someone the technology to know how to keep track of what's going on and charge people and, and route things. And, uh, and we, the, there are a lot of things that have to be done. So I, I think I, I sort of missed that, that that is the most significant point. The government does not, the NSF does not want to run research networks. The Department of Energy does not want to run research networks. Uh, nor does NASA or anyone else who's a member of the Frick. Um, so that that plan should be out and available for people to look at, hopefully next month. Any questions? I'd, I'd just like to reinforce what Bill just said. I think all of us <coughs> who've been involved in this planning across the nation understand that during this period of rapid evolution of, this, of these networks, it makes sense for there to be heavy cooperation um, in R&D with the actual provisioning and so on. And that's really the model we've been following almost everywhere in the nation. We've had substantial involvement, industry, higher education, federal government, research people working with uh, uh, people to deliver things. But um, we all believe that somewhere in the five to 10 year time frame, there's a need to uh, create a production infrastructure in the United States for this kind of networking that is different from what is now being done as we build this up. Um, and, and we anticipate 
So that will be a much, very much more business as usual kind of environment than the kind of environment that we're using uh, essentially to lift ourselves by our bootstraps. Uh, our next section is uh, presentations by California networks and uh, what's going on in California. Uh, the presenters have a uh, formal task of trying to tell you everything about their network in only 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, first on the list is Bill Yunt from Stanford University, representing right. Barnett. I'll talk a little bit about the history, objectives, and charter, the organization and operation, funding, technology, and the current demographics of Barnett, the key resources, um, very briefly, and a little bit about futures. History. Barnett got going in 1986 with a grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, it was launched by the actually in 87. It's been operational since, what, early 88? Right. And uh, so the point here is that this stuff's pretty new. Now, Barnett's history is, is a little uh, uh, interesting from the standpoint that uh, its predecessor was called uh, the Bay Bridge, actually. <laughs> and. Uh, and was a, a network between UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco, and Stanford intended to support uh, traffic to the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which those three institutions are members of the consortium of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And rather than run separate links to San Diego, the three agreed to combine their access to San Diego over one link and network the three campuses together. That was different than the model that uh, SDSC was, was uh, then supporting, which was based on different networking technology. Since that time, the San Diego Center uh, has migrated so that they can now support TCP IP technology and do over the national network. So the evolution for us worked out quite well. Uh, we now have, through, through the Bay Area Research Network, not only access to the San Diego Supercomputer Center, but to all of the national supercomputer networks. <coughs> the Barnet is a no-host bar, Nat. That is to say, there's an important distinction, and Doug made it, but it might have slipped by you. ARPANET was largely a host network. That is, computers connected directly to the network, by and large, for, for all of the early years, really, of ARPANET, uh, to uh, IMPs, the devices that, that uh, later became known as PSNs, packet switching nodes, which, which hosts had a direct link to. And uh, most recently, most of those links were 56 kilobits, but some of them were 9.6 and other speeds. The later, later in its life, uh, more and more gateways began to be connected to the ARPANET, so that instead of having individual computers connected to it, there became networks of computers connected to it. And this evolution took place with a hierarchy of, uh, uh, evolving. Uh, the Barnet is only an internetwork network. It does not permit host computers to be connected to Barnet per se. It's a network among the campuses, among networks. Now that is true of most of, uh, I think probably all, of the regional networks in this hierarchy that was described by Doug earlier. Uh, Barnet's objective was performance, that is for research purposes in its in its uh, formation, rather than connectivity, meaning that, uh, that the initial emphasis in the formation of Barnett was to create high capacity, high demand capacity facilities among research organizations to try to do new things, things that had been, uh, uh, had barriers imposed by bandwidth previously. So it was initiated uh, and was the first of the regional networks to be implemented entirely at T1 speeds among the initial nodes. It was uh, targeted to be a low overhead operation. The notion was because uh, funding was limited by the National Science Foundation, in a way that I'll discuss later, uh, that uh, uh, the support, the infrastructure would have to grow slowly and that initially the labor to keep the network running would be supplied by the participants, that is basically taken out of hide from existing activities. But that the concept of the network was to run at low overhead, and that means by definition service levels that assume the existence of a campus 
with an infrastructure on the campus to manage its networking needs. So that the internet becomes a routing, connectivity, and network operations enterprise, not a service delivery enterprise necessarily per se. Uh, shared responsibility, I just mentioned, it was, it was part of the charter to assume that the organizations that were uh, charter participants, and I'll mention who those were in a minute, uh, would share the responsibility for the operation and, ma and management of the network. And uh, the objective of longevity was to, to achieve a financial infrastructure over time, where time was by the end of the National Science Foundation three-year grant period, uh, to permit, uh, not necessarily uh, require, but to permit self-sustaining operation by the membership. The organization, <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about organization and operation. Uh, the development of the organization is taking place in what can be described as three phases. An informal phase where we organize as an activity uh, uh, through Stanford, who was actually the grantee from the National Science Foundation, with informal member agreements among the respective sites. We are now uh, in the process of transitioning to an unincorporated association with a legally structured charter uh, in under state law such things that are not incorporated are by definition unincorporated associations and uh, and they can be chartered and have differences as you know in liability and the like so that eventually we see a, a long-term nonprofit uh, corporation being the stable structure but uh, we're not sure whether that should take place as an evolution of Barnett or, th or from some other uh, methodology, such as the merger of networks in the state of California. So we've not been in a great rush to make that happen and spend the money to cause that portion of the infrastructure to occur. The governance structure of Barnett is composed of a board of participating institutions. Now, these are 501c3 or government organizations. That is, the, particip the voting members of, of the Barnett Board are only those organizations which are, are nonprofit research and education organizations. There are uh, uh, other forms of membership, but they are non-voting, and I'll talk about that in a second. There is an executive committee, uh, which is composed, in effect, of the original charter member institutions who felt it very important to preserve certain aspects of the, of the character of the network, high performance research orientation being one. That is, to, to avoid uh, subverting that objective to a longer term objective of connectivity. Unless the high performance objective can be maintained, the connectivity objective will be sacrificed, is the notion. And so the, the executive committee, amongst other things, maintains a veto power that allows it to prevent the change in purpose of the basic organization from uh, its original purpose in support of research. <clears throat> a technical committee which governs the uh, uh, routing topology and other issues that are technical and uh, executive director administration and operations as the sort of line organization reporting to the board. I mentioned voting rights, uh, I mentioned voting, the rights and duties of membership are uh, and I think this is important because it is a characteristic of the of the national network. They may be different. That is, the the um, use rules for regional networks may differ from the use rules for the national backbone. Nothing prevents that in the uh, granting of funding from the National Science Foundation to a regional, but the regional must impose on traffic that uh, uh, is delivered into the national backbone, those use rules that are imposed by whatever the national backbone use rules uh, 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 require. S uh, those are, at the moment, um, less than uh, uh, complete. That is, some tentative use rules have been established, but they are relatively broad. The notion of use that the National Science Foundation is trying uh, uh, to promulgate is one that would allow not just research use per se, which is of course the National Science Foundation's business, but uh, also use in support of research in a much broader context. So that if an industrial <coughs> organization is not engaged in research 
uh, that is funded by the National Science Foundation, but has its a research establishment and relationships among its researchers with, with the rest of the research establishment. Their use of the network is will be considered, in general, a permissible use so long as it meets the other parts of the guidelines. We must pass on some of those rights and responsibilities, um, uh, but we're, we don't have to pass them all on. On the other hand, we, are, uh, we have adopted the position that we will avoid at all costs, in essence, becoming a commercial network. So uh, prohibited transactions include any kind of, of uh, commercial transaction between commercial sites. Uh, it is assumed that transactions that are one-ended, meaning one end of the transaction is a research site, are for the purposes of support of research. And then there are other specifically excluded rules, if anyone's interested, I can provide copies of what the Barnett use rules are. The operation has been a bootstrap then, basically. It is, uh, uh, was the initial funding constraints provided a way to get going. We rely on campus infrastructures to keep things going initially, and uh, while we develop an independent structure that uh, is self-sustaining, and that's we're in that stage now. The initial funding for the National Science Foundation was about 300,000 in capital funding, which bought routers, DSU, CSUs, and other such things to to allow us to activate circuits among the sites, and 120,000 a year in circuit costs. Uh, in the first stage of growth, uh, we've added per participatory membership, uh, members who have provided their own capital to purchase the equipment which Barnett owns, about 150,000 addition uh, in the early stage, and another 100,000 a year in circuits, and, uh, and then, of course, some additional free labor to keep things running. Now, that included organizations like Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, uh, which has provided two circuits, one from Berkeley and one from NASA Ames. And I'll mention something more about that in a second. Bill, is there uh, any state or federal funding at all? In there is federal funding from the National Science Foundation. There is no state funding. And uh, we've, we're negotiating, just completing negotiations of an agreement through NASA that uh, provides funding for the transition of the remaining ARPANET sites in the Bay Area to Barnett. There are six of those that are government research contractors uh, who have no connectivity when the ARPANET uh, is decommissioned. And uh, that should be around the end of this month. The, pr the process of decommissioning is underway now. So the uh, DARPA uh, uh, sponsor of ARPANET has provided funding for one year to allow the transition of those sites to the regional network, which is uh, helping us also support the growth of the infrastructure. It will, it will give us a year of, of stable internal <coughs> growth that will permit us then to reach a self-sustaining uh, level at the end of the NSF grant. Do you see the state as being a, uh, a viable uh, Bob, I think that's an excellent uh, question. One I think we should defer because we don't know how to get from here to there. But uh, I th we certainly would like to see the state have a vested interest in a statewide research and education network. And they already, some other people, Richard, for example, will talk about how they already have an investment in the UC system and, uh, uh, and our colleagues in the California State University system similarly. Well, that is indeed one of the roles that we think uh, uh, Pacific Bell could be very helpful in. Uh, with us because we are, are not well organized for that kind of effort and we can use help from any source that uh, has experience in it. Uh, our current budgeting is predicated on the notion that, that NSF will provide national backbone too, that is that we won't have to and as Doug described to you that is uh, something that is in progress now, that is uh, we're re they're reconfiguring the backbone to be a multiple T1 backbone instead of a single split backbone, and the funding for it is stable for a five-year period, so there's little risk that that portion of our, of our needs will uh, uh, fall upon us. The ARPANET transition funding I mentioned provides 200000 in additional capital, 100000 in operations, and another 50000 in circuit costs. And the place where we really are growing now is leverage from corporate research affiliates, which is the class of membership we call uh, for-profit organizations. 
uh, they must meet the criteria established in our membership guidelines. Uh, they have provided uh, about 600000 in capital, 250000 in operations, and 400000 in circuit costs. Uh, so if you sum all those, you can see that we're in roughly the, the million dollar range, although the distribution of where those funds are expended is uh, uh, both by the members, because many of them are required to purchase their own circuits to come to the, to the routing node nearest them, uh, or by the central Barnet organization. <clears throat> in addition, we expect regular member fees, that is, those from nonprofits, to produce uh, uh, a small offset to the loss of the NSF grant funding. Our technological experience and demographics. Well, I won't say much about the technology, except that we started being, uh, uh, in terms of the, of the skills of the people that are brought to bear from educational institutions, we're very knowledgeable in the local area networking side and in campus-wide high-performance networking between UC Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, there is uh, a, a great deal of skill and talent in those areas, but we were pretty light in understanding high-speed wide area networks. As a matter of fact, pretty much everybody is pretty light in understanding high-speed wide area networks. A lot of people seem to understand low-speed ones. <coughs> so. Uh, we've, we've learned that that weakness had to be overcome. We've, we've, we are still learning. We're still having difficulties, for example, understanding when, when a T1 or making a T1 into a real T1. Uh, as you all know, most T1s, uh, if you run them through multiple kinds of, of uh, telephone facilities, run at 1344, not 1544 in effect, because you have to bit stuff or steal to uh, uh, meet the bit density requirement. <coughs> we, however, use uh, uh, DSU CSUs that allow us to run at full bandwidth. Uh, routing and management, we've done some learning on, and performance and reliability has generally not been so much a problem as we thought, except in the context of the uh, problems associated with running a network of T1 lines to different customers of of the tele of different telephone companies in some cases where it's it's interlata services or even of Pacific Bell where uh, the customer sites are distributed now recently we've been working with your team to try to bring together things in that regard and we'll talk about that more later I hope demographics there were six charter members there are now 22 current sites active we expect 40 by late 89 now that is going to be 40 by summer um, we estimate that there are 500 supercomputer users active on our networks. These are incidentally terribly off-the-wall estimates. About 18,000 connected computers in Barnett, 50,000 male users, and about 150,000 potential user population right now. The topology started with the charter membership looking like this with T1 links to those sites. No redundancy in the backbone. If we have a single path failure, the, the network bifurcates. It was then altered to look like this, uh, and now a single path failure. Incidentally, we've had two, one near Oakland when you had a fiber outage uh, a few months ago. That was a major fiber catastrophe. And, uh, and one uh, near Stanford, which was a T3 MUX, I believe. The network now looks more like this. It has gateways to, through NASA, the National Science Foundation network, and ARPANET at Berkeley, which I think is going away momentarily. Uh, that will be shifted to SRI. And uh, then there are now a number of other locations, and you probably can't see them, so I'll show you a brief list to give you a feeling for the kind of enterprises that uh, are involved in Barnett. In the government and education side, NASA Ames, Stanford, including the Linear Accelerator Center, UC Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Davis, San Francisco, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and Lawrence Livermore National Labs, USGS, and Menlo Park. A lot of small companies that have uh, some of these are companies. This was one of the DARPA uh, ARPANET or DARPA contractors ARPANET sites. Apple Computer in their Unix group. BioNet is a national network resource for biogenetics. Um, Bridge 3Com, a supporter of networking products in use in research. DEC Western Research Labs, ESL, FMC Research. 
Exelon Kinetics, another supporter of, of equipment that's in wide use in the research community. HP Laboratories, Crestrol, et cetera. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's a lot of fun. They are on the shores of Monterey Bay. They have the only floating network node in the United States that I know of. It's a uh, uh, tracking antenna controlled link between a ship at sea which has a submersible underneath it connected by cable so that they actually have a research link to a, to a floating submersible via the Bay Area Regional Research Network uh, from their local Ethernet and at, at Monterey through a, a, a 10 megabit pipe to the ship and, uh, and a uh, pipe to the submersible underneath it. Uh, there are a number of others in here. SRI recently connected. Sun Microsystems not yet connected, but planning to. And uh, it gives you a flavor of, of the kinds of organizations anyway. Key resources. Well, there are many supercomputers in the Bay Area, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, facilities at UC, Lawrence Livermore Labs, etc. There are research facilities, high energy physics, space sciences, integrated systems, laboratories that are available over the network. Uh, library catalogs and databases, something more of, of more interest to the public sector, potentially in the long range, including, I don't know, I, I never spell Melville right, Richard. Yeah, it's pronounced Melville. <laughs> the UC system, uh, library automation system, uh, research libraries network, which is physically located at Stanford, but is a separate corporation. Yes, uh, they're on the air now. There are many medical information databases, international gateways, as uh, we mentioned, not just through the NSF net, but other ones as well, including BitNet gateways. Uh, uh, we, we estimate at Stanford we have 200 publicly accessible databases over the network, which include things like social services databases for Santa Clara County. <coughs> and finally, futures. Well, we're expanding like a weed in Northern California. Um, I now expect this, this is more like the membership we'll have by the end of this year. The Internet Federation is an important aspect of, of our planning and activity. We are looking forward to it providing uh, uh, better collaboration with other networks as well as visibility, but a north-south link that's inter Internet independent, meaning it's not funded by the federal government, is something that's very important to us all because of the frailties of federal funding, for one thing, and second, because um, I read the other day in a Wall Street Journal supplement that 38 percent of the federal research money comes to the state of California, which is pretty astounding. Uh, so maybe we didn't, needn't worry about research money supporting this, but uh, I do because I've worked for the government. Uh, capacity and topology improvements we're looking forward to, including cooperative ventures with industry. Now, while they have a plan to take the national backbone to 44 megabits, we have no such plan for Barnett, nor do I know of uh, whether other networks in California have plans. We certainly don't have funding for it. Consolidation uh, we expect to happen over the long term, that is merger and a, some statewide successor potentially. I'm not sure how that will work out. And uh, federal and state funding, well, Bob asked the question. I don't have the answer, and that's one of the reasons we're here today. I am Bill Jones, and uh, I am the uh, director of the NASA Science Internet uh, Program. Uh, it is a uh, program whose concept was introduced at the uh, Fix-It Committee in San Diego. And um, I took some license with the name. I grew up with the, uh, the ARPANET having managed one of the nodes at Ames Research Center uh, since 1970. Uh, in fact, we used to work with John Postel, who was then at the San Diego, uh, University of California at San Diego. But the notion of the internet, of networking networks, as opposed to tying computers together, was important to our agency because we have uh, an installed base of digital VAXs, which were using a licensed product known as DECnet. And we had to recognize the fact that that was not going away. We had to assure them that they were not going to be threatened. And even when I stand up today, there's probably somebody here that's going to whisper in somebody's ear that Jones is trying to do the Space Physics Analysis Network in, which is our DECnet. Our brothers in the Department of Energy have a similar group of people that are fiercely proud of their HEPnet, and it is a network that is very effective, and it's going to continue. So the notion of Internet 
in the NASA terminology is to embrace both the DECnet protocols and the TCP IP protocols and find a way to make technology moderate the growth of cost. There are many non-technical problems to solve. There are some technical problems, too, which are very interesting and challenging. The objective of this program, though, in the sense that we're dealing with two protocols, suites, and we don't want scientists to have to worry about choosing up sides, is to find ways of accessing computing resources, not just NASA resources, but resources for which the agency has some scientific interest, a common community of interest, to access data. We sponsor a number of data archives and to access collaborators. So we have a requirement to support a wide range of programs and projects, a wide diversity of computers and networks within the agency and with the university community that we sponsor research at. And we're looking for minimum cost solutions because one of the fastest growing items in the science budget is not the cost of supercomputing, but the cost of communications. We need also to provide accountability and traceability when we meet these requirements. There has been a strong tendency on the part of our science users to strap things together without really worrying about the, the, uh, the accounting amenities. And so consequently, as we have grain, uh, gained in, in technical success, we've also gained in visibility, and we're being asked a lot of hard questions. And so consequently, we have to spend more time in looking for accountability. So our approach in the internet program in the agency has been to build upon the existing space physics analysis network, SPAN, and the NASA Science Network, the TCP IP counterpart, and to consolidate where possible the circuits that have been installed. Uh, we want to share basic services, to do the obvious things, to get economy of scale, to coordinate the networking activities of our agency with the activities that we have grown uh, accustomed to, those of DARPA, those of the National Science Foundation, and more recently, uh, the other agencies that are now parting, uh, party to the FRIC. And to make use of, of, for example, the NSF net backbone to the extent that we can. Uh, we have a requirement to uh, provide networking services uh, that are essential for the space science. Now, our program is basically sponsored by the Office of Space Science and Applications, which is a major component of the agency. In contrast to the Office of Aeronautics and Space Technology, which basically funds Ames Research Center and Lewis Research Center and Langley, the Office of Space Science and Application focuses most of its activities at the Goddard Space Flight Center and at the Jet Propulsion Lab with smaller programs sponsored by the Office of Space Science and Applications at Marshall Space Flight Center and at Ames. And uh, we basically want to provide uh, a, a way of connecting scientists to databases and to support all the NASA science programs. Now, one of the challenges in this program is that there are yet other science activities that are not so characterized that the Office of Space Operations, uh, that is the space station and the, uh, the infrastructure associated with the space station, which is a very large program and that's starting to uh, take shape. And, uh, and consequently, there are some technical issues on how we devel uh, develop uh, interfaces to these other networks. Uh, we've introduced the notion of a basic level of service, which it currently is basically a 9600 baud service to any scientist that NASA sponsors anywhere in the world. And uh, if we have to provide additional services over and above that 9.6 line, uh, we will do that. But we make note of that, and we have some ways of managing costs, which also have the effect then of moderating demand. So uh, the implementation of the NASA Science Internet is basically to support SPAN for the DECnet user, to provide NSN for the TCP IP users. And typically, this is a more recent development. People that have been buying things other than uh, digital VAXs or uh, workstations and are buying Sun Microsystems, <coughs> for example, uh, wanted an alternative. Berkeley Unix 
comes bundled with a uh, package of protocols that uh, make it very attractive to use the TCP IP. And so we have simply been able to respond to those folks with uh, a broader look at networking. Uh, we have institutionalized the project and it is managed at Ames with major roles for the uh, centers noted there, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, Jet Propulsion Lab, Marshall Space Flight Center, and Johnson Space Center. And we fully intend to transition the operation of this network, both TCP IP uh, as well as DECnet, to uh, what we call Code T, the Office of Space Operations, which is responsible for NASA communications. Historically, NASA has provided uh, basically in-house uh, what we call operational communications, NASCOM, for, for flight projects, the, the shuttle primarily. Then more recently, with the Davisinger's decision, <coughs> NASA got into administrative communications and built the NASA telephone company called the Program Support Communications Network, PSCN, and we operate a T1 backbone between the 17 NASA facilities that make up the agency. On those networks, we have been building computer networks, and the SPAN folks got started by uh, building a network that would run DECnet, and more recently we're doing it with TCP IP. We have a lot of user services, but I want to call attention to the interfaces that are making this project particularly interesting, because within the agency we have responsibilities uh, for the basic uh, long haul with code T, that is uh, NASA jargon, the security of computer systems resides with code N, and there is a great deal of regulation concerning ADP resources. And then because we are interfacing to uh, scientific partners in Europe and in Japan, Australia and New Zealand, we have yet another code that deals with international relations. And our little old project, which is managed out of code R, is dealing with these others. And so it's exciting in the sense that we're learning a lot about the agency that we wouldn't really have an opportunity to do before. We've also had an opportunity to, f to interface with other agencies, which adds an additional dimension of interest, and also a lot of travel. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, currently we are working with our NASA counterparts in Europe, ESA, uh, NASDA in Japan, as well as ISES and a number of other institutions. I'm not going to say much about funding, except that in order to get this project launched, we had to uh, impose a tax on the science disciplines, because heretofore it had been paid, the networking had been paid exclusively by money being stolen from different accounts <clears throat> in order to get something together, and it's amazing how much you can do uh, in that mode, but it is certainly not an effective or cost-effective method, and so we have pulled all costs for networking into one uh, one budget, and we are now in the process of defending that among uh, peer review processes, which is, a, I think, a much more orderly way. <coughs> I don't think I'll say any more. I'll just give you a picture now to relieve the, uh, the bullet charts and show you what we have in place today, and I'll give you a little bigger view of that in a, in a moment. The Space Physics Analysis Network, as shown at the top, and uh, what should jump out at you is the fact that there are, it looks like there are four hubs. There is a hub at Goddard Space Flight Center. There is a hub at Marshall Space Flight Center. There is a hub at JPL. And there is one at JSC. And you have a lot of lines running out. One of the things that happened within the agency is to moderate the cost growth by the, the new PSCN which is providing the long-haul circuits, was that all these tail circuits would be paid for by the program that had the requirement. And suddenly, a lot of requirements started getting scrubbed. And so we spend a lot of time looking at requirements to see if there's some way of moderating the demand. <clears throat> the bottom chart shows the NASA Science Network. You don't see many tail charts. What you really see is an outline of the backbone that is provided by our NASA uh, telephone company. Basically, uh, these circuits are, are bought by our support service contractor, Boeing Computer Services, from AT&T and the various uh, uh, Bell operating companies. And we have a Kennedy Space Center and Marshall and so forth. And wherever traffic can be run on those lines, that cost is carried for, with, uh, by the uh, 
by the Code T folks. <clears throat> Give you just a feeling for the program organization. We have uh, at NASA headquarters a program manager, which is Tony Villasenor, who was shown on the, the Frick chart. We have a science steering committee made up of the various using divisions within the agency and a project scientist, uh, Dr. Bruce Smith at Ames. And uh, then the NASA Science Internet Project Office at Ames that's responsible for the total uh, development and uh, operation of the network. We have the two networks that have grown up. Uh, we have a SPAN Network Operation Center at Goddard Space Flight Center and we have a new operation center for the TCPIP at uh, Ames. Now, this is much more integrated into the internet, so we rely on a good network of personal contacts with people at the National Science Foundation as well as the various DARPA, MILNET, and previously ARPANET uh, operation centers, as well as regional networks. The purpose of centralizing the project was to collect and manage the requirements because the requirements are what translates into costs. And we want to consolidate the cost drivers, which are basically the tail circuits that the telephone companies provide. <clears throat> we want to provide the overall systems engineering so that we can find technology that will allow us to consolidate requirements onto, onto single lines and to establish in a coordinated way interfaces to other network systems resources. And at least for the time being to provide customer support. Now this goes beyond what Barnett is providing. Barnett is in a sense a no host <coughs> implementation. We unfortunately have a lot of demand for services that go beyond what we would like to provide. We would like to provide basically a wholesale service and let the various communities of interest provide their hand-holding. But right now, we're not in that position. And in order to, to advance, we have to provide a fair amount of customer support. This is an area that clearly could be contracted out. And rather than just continue to proceed uh, with that as a given, we're going back and looking at all the tail circuits that we've got. And we have uh, established a, uh, for, for NASA internal, um, a requirements process that coordinates with each of the NASA centers and the policies of that center allows our project to do some uh, re-engineering of those circuits and to uh, then ask for new circuits or elimination of circuits for these two operational networks. Uh, one of the important keys to the program is to introduce the notion of a basic uh, a level of service for the researchers which is a 9.6 line, whether it's domestic or international, <clears throat> to support DECnet as well as TCP IP, and to provide interoperability for email. Now, this is where we see uh, a cutting edge for getting into the OSI suite, because there is now an OSI package available for mail, X.400, that we are uh, in installing and one of the ways to provide the interoperability is to put gateways at some key locations. So our project has funded application gateways at Marshall Space Flight Center and at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. We have projects, space, spacecraft projects in particular, that do not qualify for NASCOM services, which is mission critical, has special restoral rights of long haul lines, but have near real-time requirements. And so where we have those on a case-by-case -case basis, we will install additional bandwidth, and we will charge the cost of that additional capacity back to the project. Now, right now, a lot of this is done manually. We have a rather elaborate database design, which will allow us to do a lot of our cost accounting internally and automatically. But until the technology is there in the gateways and in the, uh, in the routers, uh, we do not have the ability to track costs at the level that management would like. I think I'm going to skip the, uh, the examples uh, for advanced application and concentrate on some international extensions. 
because this is where we have some extremely high costs. And as uh, Bill Boswick mentioned, if we can, for example, get a fiber to uh, Europe, that would, would be one possibility of consolidating a number of federal agency requirements onto a trunk and improve the cost effectiveness. <clears throat> our, our requirements to connect to NASDA, uh, the uh, Japanese NASA, is uh, going to be handled through a grant to the University of Hawaii, which has already got uh, working relationships with Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. And we will be using the new fiber cable that is crossing the Pacific. We have NASA-sponsored projects in these institutions and universities. And so consequently, we are having to deal with interfacing with the European uh, communication standards. And then, uh, yeah, the uh, international coordination that is uh, interagency coordination is shown here. The, the need to get into higher speeds is, is, is evident in some of our space projects. And so we will be doing that in concert, in concert with the Frick and, uh, in particular, the Research Internet Backbone. We are sponsoring some of the activity to build a higher speed, higher performance gateway, uh, which is a contract that's been actually a, a several contracts that have been let. And uh, finally, I think uh, this is a chart that uh, Doug Van Helling didn't show, but it's from his organization. This is the, uh, the NSFNet T1 backbone. And what NASA is doing is in California, for example, it ties into Barnett. Uh, we also want to tie into Los Netos when that's added. We tie into other networks, uh, regional networks at other locations. For example, at Suranet ties into Goddard Space Flight Center. So when you look at the NSN overlay, you'll see that uh, we can leverage off of the NSF regionals very effectively because these are basically hubs uh, for the NASA Science Internet with the TCP IP. And any of these hubs that we've installed have also been installed as dual protocol capable. And it's simply a matter of working out the management problems to actually run a dual protocol on the NASA component of the uh, backbone. I have the uh, dubious task of talking about two networks in 10 minutes. So, uh, but I think I can do it. Uh, one, the first network I'd like to talk about is the San Diego Supercomputer Center network. And um, I guess the first question to answer is what is a supercomputer center? And there are very many of them in the United States. We happen to be one of the ones that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation in 1985. There are five uh, four other ones that were sponsored at the same time located through different states in the Union. And the one in California is located at the University of California, San Diego, and is run by General Atomics. The uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, one of the mission purposes of the Supercomputer Center is to make sure that, that education and research is, is furthered throughout the United States. So we, our user community is based throughout the United States. We have about 2,500 active users at this time on the supercomputer. And the important thing that we have to remember is to try and get those people to the supercomputer, because they're not all located in San Diego, although they probably like to be. We, uh, when we first went into business in early 1986, we put in a 56 kilobit star network formation uh, that brought in uh, universities all the way from the University of Maryland on the East Coast to the University of Hawaii on the wet in the West, and a lot of institutions in California. Uh, we have about 25, 56 kilobit circuits in now. We support a customized, we support a number of protocols, basically whatever protocol you desire. Uh, we support it. We support TCP IP. We support DECnet. We support a custom protocol called STSCNet. Pretty clever. Um, and the network has, has been in and up and running for about three years since we got going. The San Diego Supercomputer Center is funded primarily from the National Science Foundation. It's about a hundred million dollars over five years, we expect from them. The state contributes a million dollars a year to our funding. Uh, we also are getting some additional monies from the University of California starting this year. And we've also just been awarded a visualization center contract or a award from the state of California 
which will give us $2 million over the next three years each year to uh, further graphics and visualization in the state of California. Another important part of doing a really uh, top-notch graphics and visualization effort is having a good network so that people can actually do this at a remote site versus being right there close. The San Diego Super Center, Supercomputer Center is run by a company called General Atomics. It's a privately held company located in San Diego. Uh, it's, we do have floor space from the University of California, which we very much appreciate uh, because you can't afford real estate in La Jolla anymore. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what the futures are for San Diego in conjunction with the future for SurfNet. SurfNet is another project that's also run by General Atomics. Uh, it's uh, separate from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, but we do share a lot of the same goals. It's the California Education Research Federation. Uh, about a year ago, we decided that Southern California was sorely lacking in regional networks and got together with about 40 institutions and decided to write a proposal to the National Science Foundation to beg for money. And they have decided to award us the money uh, to the tune of about a million dollars a year for three years. Um, in conjunction with that funding, we also, the, the institutions themselves are contributing about double that amount in manpower and at some actual fees on top of what the NSF is providing. So it'll be about a $3 million a year network when we get going. We have about 40 institutions that are going to be first line members. We're going to start our installation uh, in April of this year. We're placing our orders right now for some of your new services, ADN, we're going to take advantage of. And um, <laughs> so <coughs> the primary uh, goal of, of SurfNet is to further research and education in the state of California. And one of the things that we are professing to do and we're going to try to do is to keep the service as affordable as possible for anybody who wants to use it. And we're not limiting the service strictly to academic institutions. It, anybody can join as long as they follow the research and education purposes of the network. We are very interested in uh, bringing the service down to the level where small uh, companies and places like junior colleges can afford to get in on this kind of thing because Certainly networking is the way that life is going these days and it pays us to get in early. Uh, the California State University system is helping out in that in that they are part of the network and are providing some K through 12 interaction through this network, I think, in the long run. So it's really exciting for us. Um, we have a, we're also part of General Atomics. We um, have a pretty, uh, Three people are going to staff and run this thing to start with, and hopefully that'll work for a while. And we pretty much will run the network for the users so that they don't have to worry about all those things like calling the phone company when things go wrong. We have about 40 sites that will be cut over during this year and expect we're anticipating about 25 to 30 percent growth per year, depending on how fast we can um, turn up the existing sites. And right now we have a pilot network that's running IP over X25 for the California State University system. This is a topology map of SurfNet itself. Uh, none of these lines are installed except this one at this time, but we anticipate that the bulk of them will be installed by the summertime. Um, we also have some connections into Los Netos, which John will talk about a little bit later. And I think the exciting thing is, is that you know we're we're not stopping here. The two things, the two ways that we're going to progress with this network, uh, one is that we want to make it available to all users, regardless of how much money they have. Well, we want them to have some money, but they don't have to have too much. Um, so we're going to try and expand it so that we can offer some dial-up services maybe by the end of this year. Um, and then on the other hand, we, in conjunction with SDSC, we're working together to provide some more exciting opportunities in Southern California. Uh, we have an opportunity to upgrade this link potentially by the end of the year to a DS3 link in conjunction with some testing that we would be doing with Bell Laboratories. So we're really looking forward to that, although we can't figure out how we're going to afford the end pieces of the link. Um, and then we're also working with the Corporation for National Research 
initiatives to participate in the uh, very high-speed networking proposition that's, that's around these days and upgrade this link maybe in the next couple of years to a gigabit link and be part of the gigabit, uh, national gigabit test bed network. The University of California is a large public institution. It is given um, authority under the state constitution to manage its own affairs as a public corporation. The regents, the board of the regents, uh, is the governing body. Uh, obviously, we're a fairly large organization, about $7.5 billion a year, including um, uh, about 160,000 students, about 100,000 employees, and we include the three national laboratories of Los Alamos, uh, Livermore, and Berkeley, as well as our nine campuses. Within our environment, uh, our, our activity with respect to networking is inter-campus focus, that is, what we do for ourselves institutionally. Uh, they started, like most uh, networking efforts, as an application-based uh, effort. We have two major ones, uh, some of which you've already heard about, but one is Melville, which is the University of California's union catalog, which includes uh, basically the collections of the nine campus catalogs, and it's the online uh, connection with the campuses, so that if you need to find any kind of material in the university's libraries, you have to use this system. So it's a very important and uh, necessary kind of application that we run centrally in my office. The uh, initial work we did with the uh, intercampus networking came out of a task force report of the nine campus uh, effort in 1982 toward a communications network. That was both, that was in preparation of divestiture. That was an activity that was underway because we saw that we were going to have to take responsibilities, more responsibilities with respect to voice activity. And it was very much an integrated kind of approach. We tried to look at voice, video, and data communications requirements. And out of that effort on the voice side, we went ahead with some PBX acquisitions and then also some Centrex uh, offerings that we have contracts with now with Pacific. There, uh, there was also some discussion at that time about voice traffic but it's really cheaper to use uh, private services uh, than to try to build our own in any way. Uh, on the data side, we did install IDNX boxes and T1s uh, in 1985 to seven of the nine campuses. We, we did this basically on an economic basis, that is trying to buy wholesale with respect to T1s where we had several multiple 56 KB circuits and took some of our administrative applications, some of the, the library applications, and actually with the San Diego supercomputer for those campuses that are th in our system that use the San Diego supercomputer, we put onto these uh, T1s that are multiplexed through the IDNX. So it was very much an economic kind of, of argument uh, based on the, econo the wholesale retail market. We, uh, following on the task force report, there was this prof uh, pr document we called the profile, which was simply a statement of how, how we were going <coughs> to proceed and how we were going to interconnect. And I'll show you a chart that came from that, uh, which really sort of outlined what we intended to do. This was about three or four years ago. What we intended to do with respect to connecting the campuses for these services that we have basically operating out of the central office, our, our library application, say, uh, the supercomputer applications, and some of our administrative applications that we do for our own support services, such as payroll, and some other major services that we provide out of the central facility. Not all of these things were implemented because the world changed on us, but this was sort of the initial topology that we had in mind. And where we are today is really here. And this gets a little, con this is hard to read, I realize, but it's where it's in the, what this does is show which circuits are used for various applications. So you'll see in here, San Diego supercomputer circuits, library circuits, administrative circuits, uh, a whole variety of things that come over the IDNXs from this. There are actually eight IDNX boxes, one at the Supercomputer Center, and then we have uh, one in, in Oakland as well as in Berkeley. And then the uh, only campuses that aren't connected at the moment are Riverside and Santa Cruz, and probably Riverside will be implemented this year as part of actually the SurfNet implementation. Is, uh, part, some of the circuits will go through there. Now, on top of these physical networks that we operate, which we do operate out of my office, there is the... Uh, this one, which is more like the internet kinds of diagrams you're seeing, but this is actually the library automation uh, network, which includes those circuits that are on the IDNX backbone that we have, but also private circuits, DDS circuits of one type or another, which provide some alternate routing and some redundancy and things of that nature. And it connects, this is our primary, from the Office of the President's <coughs> point of view, it's our primary internet connection. So it's actually got a NET31 identification, 
those IBM machines up at the top are the part of the corporate data center that we have. The 3090 runs the Melville application, so it's a dedicated machine to the Melville application. And right now, it's an open access system. One of the things that we talk about at the national level in <laughs> Educom is not to worry so much about networking per se, but really people want to use networks to get to some kind of application. And that's often mentioned to be supercomputing cycles. As Doug mentioned in his, his presentation, that was one of the initiatives for NSF, but also library resources of a variety of type. Uh, this is obviously this is the tool purpose of our network for our institutional purposes, that is UC purposes, to get to the uh, Melville application that we run centrally, and then obviously San Diego for our supercomputers uh, activity. And it is the primary internet connection into bar nets, into the surf nets, into other internet activity. Just a little bit of repeat on the resources. Melville, we talked a little, it's, it includes the state library, the California State Library. So we actually have 40 or 50 terminals in the capital that, uh, that individuals either in the state library or in the capital building itself can get access to Melville, look at the UC's collections. The part of the state library holdings include the Sutro Library uh, in San Francisco. So it's really the history of California, some of the original documents. And one of the things the State Library provides to us that we don't do for ourselves is uh, government, or strictly state documents of a variety of type, which can be very important to certain types of research. Uh, the San Diego supercomputer, Susan mentioned that uh, UC is making a commitment to that. It is an NSF-funded facility, but one of the things we observed was that we get, in UC, 50% of the cycles of that NSF-funded facility. So it's a pretty important resource to us. And as part of the upgrade for additional machine cycles there, we've made a commitment of a million plus dollars a year for the next <coughs> five years toward the upgrade of that center. So UC is making quite a commitment to the San Diego Supercomputer Center. It's an extremely well-run facility, and it's one we want to continue to, to uh, support. Also, Susan mentioned that as part of the state funding for the graphics facility, again, one of the things that my office did was contract with the SDSC to provide communication support to our campuses. So we're basically a subcontractor to SDSC, uh, and then we provide some of the funding too, so it uh, gets very close. <coughs> and uh, so that, that's an ongoing, some of that networking, some of that uh, graphics capability will come back as part of networking activity. Uh, it, it also for us, it provides links through Barnet and through the uh, San Diego Supercomputer site connections to the NSF backbone. And as I said earlier, it links our major we have 14 major administrative sites uh, for computing in the university. And this provides, as part of the circuits on the T1, is several 56s that are dedicated to the SNA uh, administrative <laughs> environment. The library network that I mentioned, the logical network, the SNA logical network, and then the IDNX physical network are operated by my office. Uh, the TCP IP circuits are managed by the supercomputer center. I mean, the TCP IP supercomputer traffic is operated by SDSC. Uh, campuses are the operators of the local area network. We provide one point of interface into the campuses for any of the traffic that we, car we carry. And then our policy and operational coordination occurs through a planning group that we have made up of the campuses in my office. As far as futures, uh, we're doing an update of the plan right now. With res to recognize that several things changed from our first effort. One is that NSF did provide a lot of funding to uh, networking efforts, so it was a perturbation from our planning effort. It was uh, availability of free bandwidth that we didn't expect, so our planning wants to try to take into account the fact that we have these regionals developing, so the bar nets and the surf nets, and <coughs> that we also are getting additional money from the state for the graphics activity. We're making a contribution to supercomputing access and the library access and that uh, we need just to update our strategy to try to provide as much TCP IP capacity that we can to our campuses for these variety of activities so that uh, we do uh, maximize our return given the environment that we have. And I would echo Bill's comment earlier that, uh, and I've said to several people that uh, sometimes I feel like we're back in the late 60s when we all in universities wrote our own operating systems for computers. Uh, we don't think that's really the business we should be in, and uh, we really would look to seeing some kind of, you know, perhaps a federal model in California about some way to structure a high-speed network that we all could use that would have some logic and management to it. So any questions? On that? Yeah. Do you haul any DECnet traffic? We the haven't. We haven't. It's been one of the ongoing uh, discussions, 
and certainly, uh, but we just haven't uh, treated that as a priority. And or if there were funding or somebody identified some funding for us, we would probably do it. But we've tar targeted on TCP/IP and SNA. I'm substituting for Tom West, who wanted to be here. Unfortunately, uh, we're in the midst of a large computing procurement involving six campuses and the chancellor's office, and it needed his attention today. We've had a network, a wide area network, uh, in the California State University system for 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, we established a northern and southern, er, southern uh, regional data center and connected all our 19 campuses to it. Uh, we've evolved uh, from that time to, to what I'm going to discuss today. I guess uh, the one, the one uh, comment one can make about all these presentations is the changing nature of everything, and we're certainly typical of that. We uh, now have 20 campuses. Our new campus is in North uh, San Diego County, San Marcos. Uh, it's not quite official, but it will be in, a, in another year or so there. Uh, it's official to the extent that they're building uh, buildings and they're hiring a president, so uh, we consider it uh, our 20th. Uh, we also, of course, have a chancellor's office. The chancellor's office is in two locations. Uh, the uh, the Long Beach location where the chancellor is, and we're too large, uh, typically of, uh, of an organization like ours, to fit into the chancellor's office. So we're uh, in uh, Los Alamitos, which is right next to Long Beach and, and Seal Beach, uh, with some other units of the chancellor's office. So when you see swirl on that diagram, uh, that's the Los Alamitos uh, organization. We have about 355,000 students about 18,000 uh, faculty and 13,000 staff, and you can see the location of our campuses there. Okay. Uh, this, I think, is important. Uh, we're a little bit different from what I've been hearing uh, with the other educational uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, we don't have the uh, luxury of resources to begin with. Uh, we do have a heavy commitment to uh, to in the in the teaching area, we produce, for instance, five percent, uh, a little more than five percent of the engineers of the country, uh, and over fifty percent of uh, maybe seventy percent of the teachers in in California and so forth. But we also have research uh, needs, and we have outreach needs to K through twelve and the community college. Our network reflects that. Our style reflects that. We uh, organizationally get together with the campuses every four months. Uh, on one day, we'll have what we call the Academic Computing Planning Committee, a uh, representative from vice president on down uh, from every campus, and we'll discuss telecommunication needs. The next day, we'll have a similar type meeting with the Information Resource Management Program designees, which can also be a vice president of administration on down. And, and we'll go through the same kinds of discussions. In addition, we uh, have about nine uh, academic computing discipline councils, volunteer kind of organizations in, in chemistry, computation, or, uh, computational chemistry, and uh, geography, and engineering, biology, and the like. These are the working faculty who get together from the 19 campuses and they do a sharing of information and they come up with, with plans. Uh, and we have a, a uh, network uh, task force that meets about every six months. Uh, it has a formal structure, but the rules of the game is anyone can show up and we encourage anyone to show up to, to those network task force game, uh, meetings rather, so that we can uh, do what we can. To, we have to uh, share resources with our network, and we have for 20 years. And to get the point across, if you're a computational chemistry and at your, you're at a small campus and you want to do something in computational chemistry and you have a few peers who may not be interested and they're limited resources because you're at a small campus, you can be dead. But if you're a member of an, uh, of a computational chemistry Computing Discipline Council, and you're dealing with your peers 
uh, from other uh, institutions, then you can come into us in the central office. Fortunately, there are no campus people here. And you would never use the word central office. Uh, you can come into to the chancellor's office where, uh, in a fair and equitable way, <laughs> we'll try to develop a plan for a resource on a campus or a resource external to the California State University to just deal with uh, computational chemistry. And then that faculty member is not penalized. And we do that, and we're going to do more and more of it. Uh, this chart sort of sh shows it. I'm sorry you can't see it too well. I think, though, what you can see is the most important part, are five levels of access. And we just drill that. I mean, that's you, when we have a system-wide meeting and we say level four, they know exactly what we're talking about. Level four is where we use our network for access to some specialty center, uh, and, and it's under our own governance. If we say level five, they know exactly what we mean, too. We go to Melville. We tie into the University of California system. It's an exciting uh, service that they're providing. And that's, that's an example of level five. Uh, the chemists, that discipline council, uh, came back to us, and we include them in the official planning, budgeting and planning and the like, and, and we'll say, we want to go to UC Irvine. Well, that's part of the UC system. It's not our system. Uh, to use their computational chemistry computer. And then we'll go about and see if we can't somehow or other strike up an agreement. I keep telling Richard West that we're organized better to go in, I suspect, and exploit the UC resources than they may be. And, and I warn you, what you see on Melville is just the beginning, because we are organizing to do that sort of thing. Uh, Good, I'm glad to hear that. And here you, you see what we're talking about with the, the concept of the specialty center. Uh, we have a number of them. The uh, Molecular Design Lab, Computational Chemistry, that's a dedicated computer on Fullerton campus. All, remember, all campuses, all chemists, all this is a free good. There are no charges with anything that you see there. Uh, we uh, have an academic uh, IBM computer at San Luis Obispo where uh, serving a number of business schools. We have a Plato computer at Sacramento that gets into the K through 12 uh, area. We have a bulletin board uh, service at Fresno which uh, serves the community at large. And, and that, incidentally, is an important concept too. Every campus has got public access ports, dial-up ports. And so if you're a farmer, you can dial your local campus, whatever it is, and go to Fresno to that bulletin board and find out all the kinds of information of interest to, to farmers. Uh, and then at uh, Los Alamitos, we have a, a large system-wide computing center with various, uh, various computers. We uh, naturally are interested in, in level five access, uh, which would be to um, to these external resources. Incidentally, level one is the workstation. And level two is departmental computing. And level three would be like uh, shared computing on a campus, a mainframe kind of, kind of uh, situation. Um, OK, here's the CSU. You know all that, so I won't uh, labor the point. Um, it is an X.25 network that we have. It's a combination of uh, 56KB and 9.6. Uh, by August of next year, every campus will have 56KB, and they'll have TCP IP capability. And Bill, I think that uh, will help you with Humboldt. Yes, I hope so. Uh, so uh, uh, we're, and, and most of them will have it by August, mm -hmm. and a few of them have it, have it now. Uh, these are the various protocols that we support. Um, okay, here are various computers on the uh, the network. Of course, we've got uh, you know control data. I've lost count. I don't know, 30, 40 of those. Uh, and Prime, we must have 20 or so, and and so forth. 
This SES 40 is a, an example of a specialty center. It's on the Sacramento campus, and of course, it's a Crayette. So the chemists are, are very excited about about that. <coughs> Uh, I didn't see a sun workstation on that list. Oh, they're all over the place. Level, uh, but you see, that's a oh, to us. Level one, yeah. <laughs> that's level one to us. Yes, Maybe level two. <laughs> 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 yes, and in fact, Sun has been extremely generous, and have uh, they have given us, uh, without any real obligations at all, nineteen um, uh, sun workstations. Most of them in the. Uh, the uh, 410, uh, and 10 of them went to chemistry departments. Uh, the um, and that was about a $600,000 grant. So yeah, we we have sons all over the place. Uh, we even have a bulletin board in my shop that you can access on the Nix workstation if you're interested in all the problems of Nix workstations. Uh, here's another uh, diagram of our backbone. Remember, we got all the campuses going into those various nodes. Um, with the exception of San Luis Obispo to San Diego, that backbone is uh, in existence now. And as you can see, we have redundancy, and we're talking about 56 KB links there. Uh, OK, here's the, the public access ports. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're doing, we've got a bulletin board on, on our network. And high school counselors can dial in to the local CSU campus to a, a public access port and access the bulletin board and get all kinds of information of interest to them in counseling uh, high school students. And we're going to build on, on that. Uh, once you get into this bulletin board uh, outreach, it just grows and begins to consume you. So we're going to see more and more of that sort of thing, particularly servicing K through 12. With the community colleges, we've got a study going on right now uh, with, in, in which we're exploring what does it take to link up four community colleges to our network, two in the north, San Jose's one, Santa Rosa's another, two in the, two in the south, uh, Cerritos and Mount San Antonio, and the community college chancellor's office in Sacramento. Uh, connect our network to Teal. And, and, and then treat these four community colleges like they're our own campus. I mean, they would have, they would have a, um, a link to the network just as though they were Bakersfield. And uh, we're just exploring that now to see what the costs and the problems. The community college wants to actually use our network, in some cases, to move files back and forth. And uh, the community colleges, as it turns out, have about 11 IBM computers and about 30 Eula Packards and a bunch of DEC. So in our thinking, it looks like a TCP IP kind of problem. So we'll know in about a month or so whether they're really interested in making that pilot happen. Uh, and if they are, and if it's successful, then we can begin to see you know, a, another involvement. Are there any, oh, I, we still have some more here. Well, I've kind of talked about the, the public access situation, so I won't labor the point. Um, and I've talked about that too. Butte we haven't done much with yet. Um, and that's it. Los Netos is pretty much the new kid on the block in this networking business in uh, California. That's where you're the anchor man. And, uh, and uh, so that, uh, and it's a very low overhead operation. And to illustrate that point, uh, my slides are. Uh, also low overhead. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, in fact, uh, you should take a, a note out of uh, Bill Young's presentation on SurfNet uh, to, to understand Los Netos and in uh, SurfNet, I'm mean, SurfNet, Barnet, excuse me, uh, North one of those things, one of those nets. Bar, Barnet started about uh, maybe the idea was about three years ago and got started about two years ago. Uh, so Los Netos is about uh, two years or a year and a half behind Barnett. And so we're at, this, we're at the very beginning stages of getting this running. Uh, we also have the other interesting situation that, that many of the area, the geographic area that Los Netos is trying to serve is a subset of the area that SurfNet is trying to serve. And many of the institutions that are involved in Los Netos for one reason 
are also involved in SurfNet for other reasons, and we're, we're working very hard to cooperate. Susan and I talk very frequently, and uh, trying to share the resources that Los Netos has established with the development of SurfNet. Now, the main purpose of Los Netos is to develop a very high-speed, low-delay IP TCP packet network in the Los Angeles area. It's to be owned by the participating institutions, not controlled by ARPA or, DC or NASA or DOE. It's, it could be used by researchers and supported by any of those entities, and then provide connections outside of Los Angeles to the various long-haul networks. And it's the map like this. Uh, and the thing that's important to know here about is how we got started. The things that are solid are installed, will be installed by uh, the RAND and IBM is not installed, but the other ones are all installed. Those others are on order. The ones in dotted lines are waiting for pieces of paper to be signed. We expect all that to be in by the end of May. Um, the network is made up of T1 lines, uh, Cisco routers. They're connected to Ethernets at each campus. Uh, it's available on each campus to anybody on campus to, to use. Uh, at several of these places, they're interconnected to long-haul networks, the ARPANET in particular. Uh, as you've seen in the earlier presentations, many of these institutions are also involved in essentially every other network that's been mentioned. You know, some of these are involved in uh, NSF net, some are involved in NASA Science Internet, some are involved in DOE nets. So, it's a, so that when somebody gets on this network from one campus, they can get access to any of those long haul networks. And as Bill Bostwick said, the area of policy based routing is uh, sort of a, a hot problem in networking design, and that's supposed to help us decide when somebody sends a datagram, a packet from, say, RAND and says this should go to somebody far away who's a DOE-supported guy that will go over DOE's long-haul network rather than ARPA's <laughs> long-haul network. And how to, manage, how to develop the protocols and the decision-making routines in the packet switches that control that is what we mean by policy-based routing. Some of, the, some of the key things that, some of the key motivations for getting Los Netos together are really these experimental things down at the bottom. And we, we certainly will use it for all the routine data communications that we have, uh, electronic mail, file transfer, remote terminal access things. We also have a, a number of people who want access to special resources, such as the supercomputers in San Diego, other special resources around the state and around the country. Uh, there are a number of specialized computing resources on these campuses within Los Netos. At ISI, we have a, a thing called a connection machine and a, another parallel computer called a this week is called Simult. Was last week was called Amatech, uh, um, and and there are other specialized computing resources on the other campuses that that we can share access to. People have formed joint projects where there's a researcher at USC and a researcher at UCLA that are working on the same problem together, and maybe using a computer at Caltech to do that. Uh, some of the experimental things that we've been working in, particularly at ISI and and at some of the other campuses, are. Uh, using data networks to support teleconferencing, where you, you have a digital packetized video communication, digital packetized speech that goes over these packet data networks, plus interactions, real-time interactions between things on workstation screens. So you can sit with a Sun workstation, have a voice conversation, and be talking to somebody about something that's on the screen, and they see the same thing on their workstation screen at the same time. And it, using the data networks to support that very interactive, very low-delay kind of communication. Also, have lots of interest in remote graphics and some of the work that, that Susan talked about in visualization. We really want to get involved in that uh, and make sure that this network is, is supportive of that. Okay. Let me uh, put the map back up here. Some of the other points uh, about Los Netos, it's one of the things that's very different from nearly all of the other regional networks, even California and in the, and in the U.S. as a whole, is that this network was started by a few particular researchers at each campus taking the money to, s to start this network out of their existing research budgets. There's no overall grant that gives us the startup money. The startup money came from taking it out of the hide of each research project, a few particular research projects at a few particular sites. Um, today we have five sites, by so the end of May we'll have ten sites. Uh, there's no 
chartering organization. Nobody came down from above and says, you guys can do a network. We just decided to do it ourselves. Uh, the real goals are this, the highest performance we can afford. Right now we can afford T1 lines. We're very interested in going to higher speeds. As soon as we can figure out what the price is, we'll start thinking about whether or not we can afford it. But we're very much interested in develops in metropolitan area networks and 100 megabit communication across the city. We'd very much like to find out what, what the price is going to be for that kind of service. Okay, that's a, that the, the individuals, the sites that are putting money into this network are sharing the responsibility for uh, maintenance and failure, that there's no staff of the network itself. All of the staffing comes out of the research projects that are participating. Uh, for the use of Los Netos itself, uh, the appropriate use rules are anything goes. That if, if you're a member of this network and you contributed to it, you can send traffic over there as you please. Now, the interconnections to the long haul networks, and they have more restrictive use policies, if they have any at all, it must be more restrictive, uh, then we have to make sure that the users that send traffic that actually goes over a long haul network meets those uh, re more restricted use policies. Uh, the costs that we quote, if so somebody came to me and says, we'd like to join your network, the cost that we would quote to them, or the cost estimate we only charge for what it actually ends up costing, <coughs> is uh, about $35,000 one-time charge to get the equipment installed and the initial connection set up, and about $35,000 a year in ongoing costs. And so that's, uh, that's sort of the story of Los Netos.